Gapcast number one deals with health, money and sexual rights in Sweden. In six minutes I will show you 300 years of development in Sweden and I will compare it with the situation in the rest of the world. I will use this diagram here. On this axis I have life expectancy, the length of life. It may be only 30 years, it may be 50 years, it may be 70 years, you know. And on this axis down here I will show the income per person in year, from less than $1,000 to up to $20,000. First question is, what is the average income in the world today? How much do the average person earn? $7,500. And the average life expectancy in the world is 68 years. But you know that the world is very unequal. There are big differences between the countries. And there are almost 200 countries. So let me split the world into the almost 200 countries. And you will see the big difference. Each bubble is a country. The size of the bubble shows the size of the population. And the color is the continent. The dark blue down here, that's Africa south of the Sahara. This light blue here, that is India, and the other light blue is South Asia. The big yellow one is China, and yellow is Southeast Asia. And here we have several colors. Uh, the brown there is Russia, brown is East Europe, uh, the greenish one there is Brazil, and greenish is Latin America, and, and this red one here is Saudi Arabia. The red ones are the Arabic countries. So Arab countries, Latin America and East Europe, more or less in the same area. And up there, the high-income countries, members of OECD. You could call them the country club of the United Nations. And that is where you find Sweden. Now, 300 years back into Swedish history. Here we go. You can see, we go backwards into history, and where does Sweden end up? 1709, Sweden are at the position of Sierra Leone today, one of the worst of countries in the world. At that year, 1709, we started at my university the first training for midwives in Sweden. This is the first textbook for midwives. So this was sort of the level where Sweden were, 1709. And how fast did Sweden progress? Look, very slowly. Slow economic growth, slow improvement of health. These are estimates of health at that time. But it's quite clear that it was more or less 100 years in Sweden between Sierra Leone and Mozambique. These are tough parts for development when you are so poor and so sick. 1810, we started at Karolinska Institute the training of medical doctors. One of the teachers were the great chemist um, uh, Jens Jakob Berzelius, you know, uh, uh, and he advanced chemical science and there were technological innovations. For the midwives, they started to use the forceps in steel. They could, they could use this to, to help a child who got stuck during home delivery to get out. You know. Rough methods, but there were also rough times. Now, now, this technology and science that came, did it speed up Sweden's development? No, not yet. It continued very slowly, 19, 1830, 1840, industrialization came, and then Sweden started to develop. But look how rough the path was, up and down, up and down. These dips here, that is famine, hunger years, that made about one quarter of the population of Sweden to emigrate to the United States. And 1870 here, Sweden were almost like Uganda is today in health and wealth. That year, we saw a result of the chemical research and chemical industry. We, we, we saw uh, the soap being introduced into Swedish hospital. And the introduction of hand washing only in the hospital reduced the death rates of women who should give birth at the hospital in Stockholm from 4% to 0.4%. The same year we made a big administrative reform at Karolinska Institute. We admitted women to medical training. And Karolina Widerström became the first female medical doctor to practice in Sweden. She practiced during a period of rapidly improving health and economy, but also a period with prostitution, lots of syphilis and sexually transmitted diseases. And she was the first one to start treatment of sexually transmitted diseases and education about family planning. But 1910, when Sweden was here, here like the southern part of India, lower part of India, then the Swedish parliament banned the importation of condoms and they stopped her consultancy and education of family planning. 
the rest here in the coming years were very different. That was the Spanish flu, the influenza. Then Sweden had a period of economic growth, a period of economic decline. And when Sweden was like Guatemala in 1933, popular movements led by Elise Otis and Jensen here, who started the Association for Sexual Education, they made the parliament lift the ban on condom and the Swedes could get family planning back. 1933, we could say Sweden started to become a modern country. Uh, public health continued to improve. You see how it goes up there. Uh, and you can see after the Second World War, there was faster economic growth. And when Sweden were almost like Brazil here, 1953, we had a situation where all pregnant women in Sweden had access to relatively good health service. And it was to become better and better. Because in coming year, Sweden had a fast economic growth. And we had a good scientific progress. These are the Nobel Prize winners of the Karolinska Institute. In only a period from 1953 to 1982, five Nobel Prize winners. And yet, when it came to education about uh, sexual health, it was only in the, in the 1970s that we introduced family planning in the education of midwives. We trained midwives from 1709 all the way up here, more or less, to 1975 without a lesson about family planning. So the sexual rights were late in coming in Sweden. But now we have a situation in Sweden where we have continued economic growth, better health and also better sexual rights. Uh, if we compare with the countries in Asia today, you can see that they have better health in relation to the economy than Sweden had. And they also progress faster, as you will see in other gap casts we are going to make. We have also realized that global health is important for a medical university. Our president, Harriet Wahlberg Henriksson, she has said that we must have uh, contact and research collaboration with all countries of the world. And if you ask her, she would say that for Karolinska Institute, uh, we need the world even more than the world needs the Karolinska Institute.